the Screaming Pods Network. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. We interrupt this program to give you a bulletin just received from one of our naval units at sea. Hello, what have we here? My God, it's full of stars. Xenopod, from the year 5000. Welcome to Xenopod from the year 5000. I am your host, Sean DeRager. Today we are talking about space truckers. And my guest is Zach Long, uh, who started up scriptophobic.ca. So, Zach, welcome oh, to. You really wanted to hurt me Xenopod. with this one today, didn't you? <laughs> yes. Thank you for this... thank you for answering the call. <laughs> oh, I remembered liking this movie when I did. Yeah, it's, this it's, was. Ooh. It's different when you see a movie when you're younger uh, and have seen less, and then when you rewatch it when you're older, it's it's different. I have a good. Uh, for some reason, I'm able to put on kind of my my nostalgia glasses and kind of put myself back when I first saw it. But uh, but yeah, so today we'll be talking about Stuart Gordon's Space Truckers. I think this is his only science fiction film, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, no, he, he did Fortress, which oh, was about right. a that's post apocalypse right. Yeah. Fortress it was fantastic. <laughs> Same era and with, so with Christopher many. Lambert. Yeah, and it had uh, Jeffrey Combs yes. as the hacker dude. Oh, okay, it's great. Okay. Yeah, so all right, so he's done a couple of science fiction. So we'll we'll talk about uh, we'll jump we'll dive into space truckers here in just a little bit and kind of unpack this a little bit and so see if we can. Did he also do the Robo Wars one? Uh, oh, Robo he Jock? did um, Robot Wars. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Here we go. It's early. I'm I'm only halfway <laughs> through my cup of coffee, so things will kind of uh, start. My, my brain hopefully will be working once we start talking about. Space Truckers and Stuart Gordon and all that. See, but that's first, where I think mine might stop working. <laughs> well, we'll we'll do our best. It's just gonna it's just gonna be <laughs> trying to fight off the sickness as it seeps in. <laughs> we'll do our best. Uh, all right. Well, Zach, I wanted to ask you first uh, a little bit. Well, first we need to talk about scriptophobic, and uh, you know, I anything I've, you want to know. Uh, what um, what uh, what is scriptophobic? When did you start it? And because uh, this is this is more than just like a movie blog. This is uh, this is focused on script writing and, and storytelling. So uh, and and you guys even offer advice. So tell me a little bit about this. Well, I have always been a fan of the genres, whether it's horror, sci-fi. I'm sure we'll get into that today, and. I actually ended up leaving uh, university for creative writing when I butt heads over with my professors over the worth of the horror genre. Huh. And I decided to combine my love of movies and watching them, making them, reading them, writing them, and combined what I had learned from my education but taken away that – that disrespect that I saw the genre get in. So right. scriptophobic is a place that is all about teaching, and it's about teaching screenwriting and storytelling specifically through a genre lens and giving it the respect and uh, understanding the depth that the genres can reach that a lot of Obviously not you guys at Screamcast and Xenopod, but a lot of the mainstream media tends to, you know, just crap all over. Right, right, and and, and when and when we want to talk about a movie that's that's a horror movie, kind of getting a lot of attention, uh, uh, then there's the debate on is this this movie's not actually horror; it's actually elevated horror. <laughs> they try horror, to horror; it, it's a thriller. <laughs> thriller. They try to put it in some other uh, 
genre other than straight horror. Either the director does or I don't know. It's a weird thing because we see this happening on Twitter all the time when there's a, all the, whenever, oh, the, whenever that debate comes up. Is this horror? The director says it's not horror. It's like, who gives a shit what the director says, who, en- who anyone else says? Uh, the film's a horror movie. But uh, we can have that debate. Later. I actually yeah. have an entire chapter about that in my How to Write Horror Screenplays book that's coming out oh, in nice. the near future. Very nice. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 one of those stupid round and round uh, debates that always happens that I just I just start rolling my eyes at whenever it happens, and I'll, I'll throw out some snarky comments online, and that's pretty much where I'll leave it at because. Yeah, I. But, except but for is. deciding that I had to put the chapter in, I just don't even touch it online. Yeah, I don't have time. Who cares? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it it is interesting because when when award seasons come around, you know, like we saw with Get Out, they put it into the comedy section uh, category. Was it comedy or drama? I don't remember actually, but I do like, remember it like... that it was something upsetting. Like why? <laughs> it made some. It made no sense. And yeah, so in the in the main mainstream is always kind of a funny word these days, but the, yeah, in the mainstream kind of Hollywood uh, community, definitely horror has a weird place in there. But even though like some of the best movies and awards were the movie movies have been horror films like Rosemary's Baby, The Exorcist. I mean, there's been a, enough film out there for horror to really have a place, a steady place in the genre categories, but it doesn't. But, uh, but, but science fiction like does, even though science fiction is kind of varied and, but it's weird because, you know, they have no problem classifying science fiction, but horror, horror is always this weird kind of a rigmarole to try to classify what kind of a film it actually is. Well, a lot of the, a lot of the look at horror through the political lens is always associated it with the proletariat and with the idea of a dirtiness so mm. that there is a bit of a classism within it as well. Hmm. That's interesting. Well, you guys have some great articles on Scrutophobic. I wanted to mention Paul Farrell's article on uh, the violent birth of the chestburster and alien, which is a fantastic oh, his, read. His written blood series is so <laughs> fantastic. He's yeah. done the dog transformation in the thing, and he's also done uh, Tina's death at the start of A Nightmare on Elm Street. Okay. And nobody else knows this, but there's an upcoming one about everybody's favorite Bruce Campbell film. Oh, nice. Perfect. Yeah. Some, some, some great stuff on there. Um, so you're, so you're working on a book. Do you guys offer, you guys offer services as well? Uh, yeah. So we have, so we have the blog, which has a bunch of useful stuff. We have written in blood, which is a script to screen look at horror special effects. We have scream right in, That's uh, my column, which ties in with the book I'm writing. And I also offer one-on-one writing classes for people done through Skype, as well as I offer um, script consultations. And we also do two podcasts at the moment. And those uh, we're trying to get a little bit more interaction in and – that's also designed at helping people okay. as well. Is that so, with, and that's with Chris Vander Kay? Yeah, that's Chris Vander Kay does. He does a solo podcast called Screenification, and he does. He's my co-host on the Script Keeping okay. podcast. Awesome, very cool. So there's some stuff to check out. Go over to scriptophobic.ca and check some stuff out there. Um, so next question, Zach. Before we jump into Space Truckers, what uh, was your kind of initiation into science fiction? Like, at what age did you start kind of watching it, diving into it a little bit deeper, and that sort of thing? Now, this was the question that I really came on the show to answer. <laughs> I got into sci-fi young. I remember being five or six, and my dad would read to me before bed, and he read me uh, Starship Troopers by uh, oh. Heinlein. He read me the Tales of the Bounty Hunters short story collection of the uh, Star Wars universe. And he he took me to go see... I saw the prequels, loved them because I was young enough, um, 
And then the, the point where it really kicked off and went from being something that I enjoyed because it was adventurous and fun and turned into something that I enjoyed because I started to see a level of depth in it came when I uh, I was shown Babylon 5, which okay. is amazing, amazing series. Shout out to Chris Vanderkay, who will never <laughs> stop talking about it. And that led me into... Oh, uh, that ended up leading me into Firefly, which led me into seeing Serenity in the theater and the emotional impact of that movie. Like I've just, it's it's been sci-fi or horror since, yeah. and so, so oh, I nice. always loved it. Loved it a lot more when I was a kid because, damn, there's some flaws, but. <laughs> There's such wonderful stuff out there right now. There's been some of the best sci-fi is being made nowadays. So it's a beautiful time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's what a time to be alive. I mean, like we got, I mean, you have all the Marvel movies are in full force. And I would consider that that's like for my kids, that's like a little, you know, get them into science fiction uh then then star wars in full force uh even though that's more like you know space opera space, space fantasy. fantasy um but it's all like all this little stuff and, that, and this is all this is what happened to me you know all these all these types of things got me more and more into the harder science fiction the more and then and then and then as it blended with horror it got into the crazy exploitations uh science fiction and crazy <laughs> b-level science fiction all that kind of stuff there's a smorgasbord kind of a that happens and snowballs as as i started getting into science fiction that's kind of starting to happen with my kids my daughter especially so it's kind of a fun ride for her she's always asking me like what movies you know dad what movies haven't i seen that you need you need to show me <laughs> so it's uh it's, it's been cool so um, but definitely, I mean, what's great about science fiction is, uh, there really is no limit budget wise. Uh, anybody can try to jump in and do science fiction. It's just what's, what is your focus going to be? And, you know, films like primer deal with, uh, time primer travel only costs like $7,000 right. to make. And it's a, it's, yeah, it's, it's very much say. a science fiction film because it's dealing with, you know, time travel and time paradox and all this kind of stuff but it's it's you know a very low budget film uh, it's basically and, said in one room yeah yeah <laughs> uh but then you had kind of in the 80s and 90s uh the lower budget b level science fiction films where they were trying you know uh trying inspired by star wars and things <laughs> like that to try to come together and and pull something together you got battle beyond the stars you got you know uh i was just like that. that was the one that popped in my head immediately <laughs> i mean they're trying but you know there's definitely inspiration there but they have a long ways to go they're not working with ilm <laughs> or anyone like that so uh so around that time um so let's let's dive into space truckers here and oh, uh, all we'll, right we'll let's see do it do. attention all personnel the room is sealed In the year 2196. Just lost contact with Command Post 3 outside the second perimeter. It's right outside! Someone has developed the ultimate destructive force. All they need is a man who'll deliver. What have you got? It is a rush shipment to Earth. No questions asked. We'll do it. Jeez, I've never seen trailers like these before. They look, um... Creepy. You better power down, Canyon. It's coming! Look out! You gotta tell us how to stop these things. Dennis Hopper, Stephen Dorr, and Debbie Mazar. Fire it up! Space Truckers. Where, where do you even want to start? That's a good question. So, Space Truckers um, feel I mean, it feels like a late '80s science fiction movie. Um, it's from it's 1996. 
<laughs> See, I thought it felt like uh, it felt Maybe its era 90s. for me. I could tell by the lack oh, of okay. cocaine that everyone was on. <laughs> Maybe, Dennis Hopper without cocaine makes right. for a hell of a boring performance. <laughs> Maybe it would have been a little bit better if it was uh, in 1986, maybe 10 years prior, I would assume. Yeah, I mean, that would be like, what, one year after Blue Velvet? Yeah. We would still have, <laughs> can you imagine if instead of playing a bored trucker, he was actually playing Daddy from Blue Velvet? That would be, <laughs> this movie I, would have blown me away then. Yeah, what's what's funny about this film is... And there's an interview on the Blu-ray that I got. And I'm not sure if it was on the DVD or anything else, but they actually get Stuart Gordon kind of telling about how the, his ideas for the film. And he had kind of was inspired by like Star Wars and things like that. But he was always like, well, you know, all these films always follow some sort of um, warrior or somebody who's, you know, somebody t- who turns out to be a warrior and everything like that. He was like, what if we just followed kind of the boring truckers? You know, that are hauling stuff, you know, while all this stuff is going on around them. And that was kind of definitely a great idea when it was done on Alien. Exactly. It's funny because in the interview, I don't think he mentioned Alien, but that's exactly it's exactly what Alien is. Alien is space truckers taken seriously uh, because that's that's all they are. They're they're these grunt workers you know, out in the middle of space. So uh, so I was like, okay, and. What's what's funny is I, f- I feel like like Stuart Gordon, I, I'm wondering, I'm trying to get I'm trying to pull up his uh, trying to get his timeline of his science oh, fiction. I've work. got him. I've got him in my head. <laughs> <laughs> so I am such this, a Stuart Gordon fan. It's unfair. We, we said we said Robot Wars. He did Robot Jocks. Robot Wars is kind <laughs> of like an unofficial yep. sequel to uh, Robot War. Or, Robot Wars is a kind of a sequel-ish Charles Band sequel to Robot Jocks. But yeah, he did Robot Jocks and then he did Fortress. So this is his kind of third venture into science fiction. Arguably, he's already crossed into it as well in uh, 86 with uh, From Beyond. Okay. As well, touch those elements. He's always been inspired by that and he's always been a provocateur. Mm-hmm. Um, he started out in theater doing... The type of theater that gets the cops called on you before he moved into film. He's always been kind of trying to do weird things, yeah. but after after the mid '80s, where he had, um, I think it's from '85 with Reanimator until '87 with Dolls, he had a good run with Brian Usna, and after that, he ran into trouble getting funding until he teams back up with Yuzna in 2000s or so. So in the 90s, we see him really struggling to get the films that he was trying to get made, made. Mm -hmm. And I think this is reflective of that in the budget on this is clearly so low that for a good 30 minutes of the films, you are film uh, for 30 minutes of the film, you just have your main characters tied up doing nothing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I thought about that because, uh, it, I mean, it. the idea is great. The world that he presents is great. This is, uh, uh, so it, this starts up with, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of like the the politics involved and who the bad guys are or whatever, but basically they create. I, re- uh, actually, I, this, I remembered this for some fucking reason. <laughs> this guy creates Sorry. these like killer robots. Uh, yeah, to take over the he wants to. He is in a conflict with Earth, and he decides that uh, he gets the his secret scientist Charles uh, Dance. Is it? I think so. Yeah. Is that who it, yeah, they get him to make the killer robots in order to send them to Earth in order to win the struggle there. Mm. But none of that matters except for that first scene and the very last scene. It. It, it was so unnecessary to even tr- say what the robots were. They could have just had it happen and would have been right. just as good. Right. Yeah. They're these, yeah, they're these, these crazy cyborgs. Now, the design is actually really cool. And they said that when they were making these designs, they basically hired models, performance models, or, you know, uh, women to go in there and perform and be, be the robots. It was actually a really cool idea because they have this kind of gracefulness to them. 
in a way like they, the, yeah, the idea they were of so, these cyborgs are really cool they reminded me of um oh, they reminded me of like the that yoda fight scene from the part two uh <laughs> attack of the clones there except instead of jumping around and just being that graceful they're not quite as acrobatic yeah but they still kind of had that flourish and yeah. it was absolutely the part of the movie that i remembered best was there there were killer robots and square pigs <laughs> yeah I was about to say the, the fact pigs. that nothing happens though for so long right because then so then uh so we're introduced to this big world, enters this like intergalactic possible war that's that's brewing. These killer robots, and then we meet Dennis Hopper, who's haul he's hauling these square pigs, uh, and he's just this this washed up trucker, and uh, he gets in in some argument, I guess, with the trucking company, and he's oh, okay, not going to so- get paid. And uh, well, he's late when he shows up. Right, right, right. He's not the best trucker. He's, you know, no. Did you get a feeling a little bit of Kurt Russell from Big Trouble in Little China (laughs) from the opening? Yeah, yeah. He just needed to be a little more magnetic, though. Yeah. Oh, he's Dennis Hopper is not bringing it in. I could not be on set with him. I would be just pulling my hair out he is given nothing if they brought kurt russell in as that character from big trouble little china oh that would be so cool can you imagine literally (laughs) like he keep his same name but nobody references the previous movie you just you just (laughs) let it kind of slide and see if anybody notices and people will be like did you know that the big trouble in little china sequel was in space (laughs) It'd be a, it'd be just as crazy as Leprechaun Four. Yeah, but it it it's funny. It's I mean, Stuart Gordon wanted this reserved performance from Dennis Hopper because he had said that he was you know he had seen Dennis Hopper in all these crazy roles and he was like, well, what if I cast him as like a good guy? But it's like it's almost like he dials things down so low that he, his charisma is completely gone. And, well, in uh, real life, Dennis Hopper was a villain. He was so <laughs> terrible in yeah. real life that he, I mean, I don't want to throw salt on anybody's <laughs> grave here, but he kind of had to play the villain because it was just natural to him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But once once he gets back to the area like he, sh- he comes in late with the pigs and it was probably like we, one of the we, other greatest effects on the film <laughs> those square pigs. oh those pigs were fantastic and i actually got into a huge discussion after the movie with i used to do a podcast with a friend of mine where we talked about films and we um i had the film history approach and she came from the sciences so we talked oh, for a wow. good two hours about the practicality of square pigs versus <laughs> any other form of shipping or growing your own meat. Right. They they, they mention it's it's done out of practicality, right? Do they met? Do they even mention that, or is it just? I can't remember if they mentioned that the, the why they said square. it was. They say it was practicality for being square. However, it makes no <laughs> practical sense to do that when your best method of feeding a colony would actually be to cultivate a fungus with protein (laughs) exactly yeah so there's your science lesson for this episode right i mean i mean these days i mean you can yeah growing a protein is a lot more uh i mean you don't you know you don't have to to slaughter anything you don't really have to transport anything live you don't have to deal with uh waste that makes sense especially when you're going over such long distances as this right uh square pigs makes no sense but it does give us the wonderful effect and the wonderful fight scene that takes place in the Square Pigs area. Mm-hmm. That is, that was one of the moments I remembered was the, here's how you throw a punch in zero G. <laughs> Which, even, even when he's, even when he's in the fight scene, he still got such a reserved, like, he, he sounds so bored to be there. Yeah. It's yeah. like, um... Have you ever seen the movie Virus from the 90s? Of course. It, well, you have, oh, damn it, I just blanked on his name, uh, Sutherland, uh, Donald Sutherland. Yeah, 
Donald Sutherland is so bored and like hates being there in that movie <laughs> that there's a scene where he purposely looks at the camera and just like puts on a shit eating grin just to go like you can tell that he's looking at it and going I'm ruining this take but it's in the movie. <laughs> That's what this whole performance felt like as it kept going on. There was moments where I went, this has to be a parody, right? Like, there's no way that this is actually happening. And then it does. Yeah, I mean, it's it, the the tone of the film is, defi- is not serious. It definitely has... It's not, But it's not a comedy either. It's not taking itself too seriously... It, it knows it's ridiculous, and that's this is where I wish Dennis Hopper would ham it up just a little bit more, um, because there's this weird, like, it introduces this weird uh, love triangle. Uh, that was so him, awkward. Because uh, <laughs> how old was he in this film? Because it doesn't make any sense. Oh, man. Because okay, it's, so it's he died him. in, like, at, like, 71, so he's about uh-huh. six. He's probably late 50s at the moment okay. in and, this and he's he's saying he's gonna marry is it is it debbie mazar uh Mazar? yeah yeah but it's not that he's gonna it's not just Empire that he's Records. gonna marry her it's that like he gets her to agree to some deal of like oh you know like if we'll <laughs> it's the type of thing where you're like oh if we make it to 40 we'll get married or like if i <laughs> think you, you did in like high school or or at summer camp yeah <laughs> Except it's a 50-year-old man doing this to a, a woman half his age, and it's it's wrong. Yeah. It is so wrong. So it's it, almost as wrong as the fashion that's happening in this movie. Yeah, the fashion's all over the place. So it enters Stephen Dorff here, and they meet in this kind of <laughs> oh, I'd uh, rather we did. <laughs> cafe, and he's kind of this hot-shot young trucker. Wait, wait, uh, wait, wait. It's not a cafe. You have to... It is diner? a fifties diner. 50s diner. Like, it is a space diner that looks like it's from the nineteen fifties yep. with all the neon clothing yep. and hot pink of the nineties. It is be you if there's anything that you that people listen and have to see, it's that diner scene <laughs> because it is so it's sensory overload. It looked like the film fell into a vat of the nineties and drowned it and sunk to the bottom. Well, I mean was this done before uh before when when is Dex's diner introduced in Star Wars is that clo- is is that in uh that's an attack of the clones right so this would be definitely be before cuz it was before holy uh, shit george Menace. lucas was inspired by space truckers everybody <laughs> cuz attack of the actually, clones has that awful 50s bug. diner you can actually then say George Lucas was inspired by space truckers, which had been inspired by Alien Resurrection, <laughs> and just start tracing it all the way back. You could, you could. It's gonna be, you know, you know, at some point it's going to hit the first Star Wars again because Alien was what seventy nine, Star yeah. Wars one seventy seven. So it just becomes an infinite loop. <laughs> I think we maybe just found the fountain of youth. Uh, I think so. I think so. So, so Debbie Ma- Mazar, Mazar, uh, she, she, you, you recognize her from uh, I don't know, Empire Records. Um, she's one of those oh, actresses. Oh, you're that, right. She was. She was in. Oh man, she was the uh, executive yeah. lady from. Oh wow, yeah. I did not recognize she's that. She's one until of those actresses moment. who's done a lot of television, and she looks. You know, you know her when you see her. But it's like you can't like I can never remember what she's been in, you know, so I'm like looking and through. I can't think of her lead in something like this either. I, yeah, I mean, she's her she's been in a lot of stuff. I mean, it says here she's been in The Doors as a as, as a whiskey girl. I mean, she's been working a long time. Malcolm X. Uh, she was in So I Married an Axe Murderer. And um, but I'm wondering if this is kind of her largest role. uh that had been her largest role at the time. So yeah, she gets kind of wrapped up in, in the plot here in the story where they basically, uh, he's owed money by the, he's in this feud with the trucking company, but he takes uh he takes a gig to transport what he thinks are his sex dolls. Uh, well, to Earth. before he takes that gig though, just he, they try to steal his rig and he ends That's up. That's right starting a fight in that diner that blows out one of the windows. And instead of having everything literally just sucked into the vacuum of space, like it should be, 
Instead, you have the one overweight actor actor that they brought in for this gag <laughs> go flying <laughs> out and get his ass ass first sucked out of the window in the most horrific homage to uh, Alien Resurrection ever. <laughs> but this was this pre Alien Resurrection. Uh, I I. I Oh, it might actually be. It might be one year before, actually. So see, look at this. Look at this. Oh, wow. So Alien Resurrection took from space. Oh, man, we are looking at the keystone of modern (laughs) sci-fi. What an awful gag, though. I mean, I mean, even just like thinking about that, like, and it's 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 man, I I couldn't even imagine. The thing that bothers me about that gag, actually, is that it's predicated on the fact that Oh, it's going to be the large man because that's what makes it funny. And I just hate the yeah. feeling of like what was going through that man's head as he's like, oh, yeah, you know, I got hired to have my ass sucked out a window because I'm fat. Like <laughs> that as a fat man, that is fucking horrifying. I don't know. I mean, who knows? I don't know. Maybe maybe he was just happy to get paid. But uh... either that or maybe he was like, ah, hell. And that get me. How can I get out of this scene quickly? This neon is starting to make me go blind. <laughs> so, so that kind of gets the plot going. And and this is a movie that kind of, as you're introduced to new characters, uh, gets a little more batshit. Um, there is kind of a forced romance between Stephen Dorff's character. I'm, I always use the actor's characters for some, for some reason. And that, that's David that's fine. I don't remember who um, they were in the I, movie. I can't remember the names, but they have like, they're, they're stuck. I was just going to come here and call him blade the whole time. <laughs> they're, they're stuck. And well, their, their ship breaks down and, uh, uh, Dennis hot. No, 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 wait, their ship it. does not break down. You are, you are misleading not, these people. Am I, they I, are, they decide they're going to take a strokes. shortcut and suddenly, Black eye, Black Rock. Oh, yeah. It is the worst scene you've ever seen. <laughs> oh man! But I'll, I'll let you paint no, broad strokes. Sorry, just broad I'm strokes. They basically down. have to fix the ship or do something, and so Stephen Dorff and Debbie Mazer, and then there's no air conditioning, no airflow. They're losing yeah, they're, air. They're running out of air, uh, and the heat is going up. Yeah, so they have to. Strip they have down. They have to strip down. And what happens when two beautiful people strip down is, you know, obviously they uh, they they have to have some zero gravity banging. But this is all PG thirteen, right? This is uh, they can't. They, the, this, is it actually? I think I have, I want to because say it's PG thirteen. It, it feels weird though with the forced rape of. The mm. one girl, and then the all the uh, severed arms and legs yeah. and whatnot. Yeah, but it was all I like, kept tame. I'm I'm trying to find the the rating here. Maybe it was um. See, it should no, be yeah, rated, rated NC- PG-13 for sci-fi action, violence, wow. sensuality, and drug content. It and should be NC-17 just for Charles Dance's robot ass alone. Yes, we need... I'm trying to move us along into Charles Dance here. <laughs> because, okay, well, here. I'll, I can get you yes. there super quick. They, they hit some black <laughs> rock, which represents black ice. They're stuck. They try to, uh, like, on... The, the, to take off the rig so that they can do some stuff it's star wars star trekky sort of fix it but what they learn is that the rig is heavily armed suddenly pirates appear and the whole movie slows right down and the rest of it takes place in this one location yes. basically yeah enter cyborg uh charles dance who he was <laughs> the guy that made the robots in the first place right right so and that opening scene, he gets absolutely eviscerated. I mean, it's off camera, but he's mm. absolutely eviscerated. But we're supposed to get, he's like, I rebuilt myself. He shouldn't have killed me in my own lab. But he's like, he's like two eighths of a uh, human. The rest right. of him is robot. How much rebuilding can you do with one arm while half of you is gone? I don't know. He he, he did a lot because he, he even had the time to... Uh, to basically oh God, no. create a robotic penis no. of some sort. <laughs> what Not, it wasn't just a, it was like a spinner or something. <laughs> I don't know what it was. It there was, was a, there was a uh, show called, um, the show was called trip in the riff. It was a sci-fi comedy, like, like a sex comedy type family guy thing. And one of the big plots was there was a robot who like 
always wanted to have a bigger dick and it was <laughs> this whole run and plot and it must have took it from this yeah because because he's obviously was was overcompensating when he rebuilt himself and basically he, um uh debbie's debbie's character agrees to, i guess agrees to uh have sex with him if as long as he'll let the other two live or well, th- that they can just he he well he would take the cargo and just get the hell out of there leave us alone yeah i'll have sex with you sleep with her yeah yeah and then because at this point they have uh dennis hopper and blade both tied up for <laughs> the next 30 minutes they have their hands over their head one of them's half naked and stuff just happens around them why debbie goes off to prostitute herself to save their life <laughs> right and this leads so i think like this is the most awkward uh scene of the film uh, you don't say <laughs> because you have this disgusting guy that's going to take off his clothes and basically you know have sex with our, our character or you know our, this okay he's not that bad until he takes them off well let's yeah. Charles Dance. He's, he's like a <laughs> handsome enough man. He's just got a little bit of robot shit on his face. Right, right. But then we realize, like, oh, take that. Oh man, all no. the bits, all the bits are robotic, and he has a little bit of uh, of some issues, you know, that Viagra can't fix. So he has to like go to his tool shelf and try to like repair his basically broken robot penis. And it's, it's, it's such a, it's such a drawn out scene. <laughs> it's also awkward, but it's like, but it's Stuart Gordon. So it's like, it's always like, well, I guess, but why, why make this PG 13, especially if this was something that looks Weird. like it was kind of self financed in a way, like independent, like he kind of had creative control. Like what kind of a movie was he trying to create here? You were re- you were uh, watching some of the special features and whatnot. Did he talk about the financing of it at all? Um, it was it, it was definitely um, out of the studio system, I believe. It's- that is, it's so weird because Fortress coming just before it was really good, and I'm pretty sure that was R because I mean they're blowing holes through people's stomach and everything's happening in that one. And then you move into this one, and it feels like I, – I mean, like I was mentioning earlier, he literally got – like he would do the type of shows that would get the police called on him. Yeah. He was he was known for this. That's why in Reanimator, you have the cunnilingus with the severed head. <laughs> yeah. Like that's what he's known for, and this feels like he's starting to he, do what he's known for and then just right. brings it back for whatever like like somebody along the way like it might not have been a studio but one of the financers or something had to say like oh you need to like go wide or something yeah it it feels it feels like they were trying they're trying to make they were trying to have this thing make some money i guess and have it be a little more for sure more broad but it just didn't did it it it, it did not this did not (laughs) uh this bombed did not make enough money um but that's the thing, like with Stuart Gordon, what do you expect from him? I feel like if he if he would have gone all the way and just gone, you know, some people say like ratings don't matter. I think on films like this, it definitely does because depending on the who's writing the story and everything and, and, and what they bring to the story, sometimes you have to, for certain gags to work, you have to go all the way. You just have to. You really do. And for a film like this, it's it skirts the line of R-rated so much that it's like but they but they just try so hard not to t- cross that line it's obvious and it would have been maybe even more well well received maybe not in the, the- maybe not theatrically but definitely would have had more legs i think uh in the video market because more you know teenagers would rent this and know what they're getting into and things like that but yeah he, he definitely plays it safe and you know the film kind of um <clears throat> kind of starts dragging at this point and then but then we get we end up you know with the pretty cool like the cyborgs reanimate and yet you know, and you have a you know a, the a cyborg fun, scene and when scene they're trying the to end. break into the cyborg thing yeah. is pretty sweet yeah totally. um, while you were talking i looked up uh Stuart gordon's other credits after this 
and he does actually you see a you see a break he does a couple very small projects but he doesn't do another real film project until 2001 mm. when he teamed back up with Brian Usna for their Spain project so this actually did impact his career negatively for the end of the 90s yeah which yeah. that is kind of it's there's moments in this film which are brilliant because when they first try to break in and the gun just comes up in everybody there's there's an endless supply of space pirates on this ship yes <laughs> it never runs out and these this thing has an automated cannon and like something like 20 to 30 of the space pirates get killed just shooting at it endlessly until one of them finally just goes ah screw it rocket launcher <laughs> but it is it is just it is very much slapstick like they just keep coming and dying it's almost like if you had that scene at the end of Rambo, the 2000 whatever one, where he's on the minigun, except that you just censored it down a little bit, it's basically that. Yeah. And then it's the, then you get the killer robot, which was the one scene that did live up to my expectations. Even in the beginning is fantastic because they get into those crates finally, and we see the robots, and we saw one of them kill at the beginning, mm -hmm. so we know they're deadly. And there's a whole ton of them hanging up, and we're like, oh, shit, like, this is bad. And one of the pirates goes, hey, one of them's missing. And there's that, that little voice in the back of my head that just went, ding, it's time for joy. <laughs> it the, these Back to these robots, I mean, they are cool, especially the way he has them kind of, because they're all hanging, you know, and he, how he has them reanimate. Like, it's, 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 a, it's such a cool idea. And... I'm wondering, you know, if you had had a little more. See, I don't know. I don't know what was holding him Wait, back. Well, uh, what part is the cool idea? Do you mean? Well, don't like they the kind fact of like that it was fill like, themselves? Don't they kind yeah. of like like the heads and the, everything comes kind of comes they, out they from look, inside? They, the, they, they look like you walked the into cavern. the the cavern from the Lost Boys at first. Yeah, like they're all they're all just ready there to come swoop down on you. Yeah, yeah. Is it, I thought. I, that that was great but the fact that they decided like oh they activate in waves made no sense <laughs> that right. was absolutely bonkers it was like oh okay we have one of them how do we increase like how do we increase the tension what if we had two of them yeah okay except that one of them could take out you know all of our space pirates but four five six of them can't seem to take out our space truckers <laughs> Well, you know, you got to make you got to make these these choices in the script writing process, I believe, uh, to keep the tension up, I, I believe. Um, I, I believe that you do, which is why they should have came to me. <laughs> even even in the 90s, I could have done better than that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's unfair. So it's funny because I knew that Barbara Crampton was in this film and she doesn't show up I'm until the end her. of the I film. She's at the end. She's Cindy's mother. Is she the mother? Yes. Oh my god! I didn't realize that was part. I... Okay, yes. she really is just in the very end. Like, very end. Oh yeah, that's your mother. Oh yeah, she was cryogenically frozen so that you can have this moment to get a partner. Right. It's such man. I have some issues with that uh, at a uh, kind of core level. Uh, oh you can, hey, you can dig into. Oh, by the one. by the way, um, my mother, who's your age. Uh, is still my age because she's been cryogenically frozen. So here's another hot young woman for you to 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 oogle over. Well, if I can't hit your spawn, I might as well hit you. <laughs> yeah. But um, I I contacted so uh, I contacted Barbara Crampton and I was like I was like I need to have her on the show to talk about the scene and she politely declined. Aww. But uh, she she wrote she's to me. She's a sweetheart though. She goes. Uh, she goes, I don't love the movie so much. Not sure it really works. And my part is so small. I'd have to watch it again and not sure I want to. <laughs> you know what? Fair on her. I'm yeah, on no. her side. <laughs> so I was like, all right. You know, she was very, uh, very polite uh, and and uh, declining there. But I, I get it, you know. But Can we talk about that end a little bit, though? Yeah, yeah. Spo spoilers we, for Space we, Truckers, everybody. Oh, um, oh I yeah. I, I, this I isn't a film so, that so sorry spoiled. about this. It breaks my heart <laughs> to spoil this for you. But our hero, Mr. No Cocaine, decides uh -huh. that he wants to sacrifice himself to save the day. Right. He is going to bring his truck into the atmosphere of Earth in order to burn it up and burn up all of these things. Because... 
you know, they're, they're, they're these trucks that weren't made to actually enter the atmosphere, they are space truckers. They're not really planet side ever. Right. It's not the Star War Wars where you can travel between the two. And so he he sends the other two out. Uh, they like go into an escape pod, come back, save him from one, and then go off to Earth. And he's like, I'll be right there. And he brings the thing down, and they're on Earth, and they're watching him. He's a fireball, and they're like, he's going to make it, he's going to make it, he's going to – it blows up. Everybody's sad, and then suddenly, out of just behind the beautiful blue cloud – a blue cloud, white cloud in the blue sky, you see Dennis Hopper come floating in. He's like, hey, <laughs> miss me, or whatever he says. And I screamed at my TV <laughs> because that was, I did not remember that happening, and that is such, uh, that is like when you watched one of the old serials from the 30s. Yeah. You see him go off the edge of the cliff in the car, but the next episode he jumps out, you're like, fuck off, no. <laughs> This is not this is cheating, sir. Well, the whole the whole ending definitely jumps into let's wrap up this TV episode quickly. Uh, we got to get rid of the bad guy quickly. We got to get, you know, oh, you, because you talk about that part because, oh, my God, yeah. that is some lame, <laughs> lame ending there. It, it's not. So, so, yeah, so we meet Cindy's mother, Barbara Crampton, and it's almost like, oh, everything's happily ever after. But uh, meanwhile, uh, this, this guy sags. President of Earth. He's the yeah. He's now the president of Earth. He was the guy who originally, in the first scene, right. wanted to kill Earth. Right. So they've botched his cyborg invasion plan, and he offers well, them like except a, that except the fact that he actually, in between the invasion plan, he had managed to win peacefully. So he is in <laughs> charge like, now. Right. So he almost sent he almost sent robots to murder his own people. Yes. Yes. So he should be thanking them. Which he is, should it, be, and well, he does with a giant. A giant suitcase full of money, or yeah. a briefcase full of money, or is it? Dun dun dun. Yeah, that. Because <laughs> so yeah, I so love you, I love that you get the the inner cut as he's like he's finally he's sitting back in his car downstairs and they're arguing like you can't just take the money, man. We can't walk away from this. And so what do they do with the whole suitcase or briefcase full of money? The only thing you can do is chuck it out the window. Throw it out the window. <laughs> <laughs> and conveniently lands on the roof of this limousine, uh, the president's limousine, and it turns out At to be the a exact bomb. Moment he presses the button. Exactly. And uh so I don't know. It's 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 you know, it's this is one of those films that I can't take too seriously, uh, that there is there is a lot to kind of have fun with if you're in the right frame of mind. If this is a, a curiosity of yours, um, there's going to be some fun to be had. But make sure I, you. I think that end scene's pretty fun, actually, because yeah, they all look down at him like it was in, um, <laughs> like it was the end of a rush hour film. <laughs> yeah, you know, totally. It, the ending is so. It's like I said. It's such like. Uh, in the in, in the eighties, more often they had these guys types of TV endings, you know, where ha ha ha, hey, you know, high five, and and we're good to go. Um, well, you know, this it, when, if we go back to what we said earlier, this would actually have been a great ending if this was a sequel to Little Trouble in Little Big or Big Trouble in Little China. Yeah. This would have been a fantastic ending because that one it all it also ends with him just going on for another adventure. This is solved. It's like <laughs> right. the end of Kung Fu. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, I don't know. Um, I have mixed feelings about space truckers. Did you completely hate it or what were, what were your thoughts, overall thoughts on, on space truckers on this revisit? And well, you, and did you watch it on VHS too? Uh, I, or, or did I, you... what, I did get the VHS, but then I ended up just watching it on my computer because oh, okay. <laughs> I got lazy. I ask you, how's that VHS look? <laughs> I, I probably would have enjoyed it more on the VHS just because I love hearing the sound of it playing. <laughs> but my my overall thoughts is that th the film actually made me a little sad in that I remembered loving it a lot. Uh -huh. And I was disappointed that the performances were really not there. Mm -hmm. But more than that, I was disappointed that, A, Stuart Gordon is quite restrained here. Mm -hmm. And you you can tell that this hurt him in that like it wasn't until 2001 that he released something else that felt like Stuart Gordon and right. there are there are moments in the story which are 
fantastic. Like the square pigs are great. The design of the robot's great. It reminds me a little bit of the Brad Dorf film Death Machine. Mm. And um, and the, the, there are a couple there are, co- are a couple special effects that are great. Like Charles Dance looks so disgusting when he on robes <laughs> that it's wonderful. It feels like for a second it feels like there's a glimpse of of like a Pasolini film, like you're watching Salo or something for just a moment. But then the problems of the film, which you can see in the makeup or not the makeup, sorry, the uh, the wardrobe, and you can see in nobody seems to really be bringing it. And the fact that for a good chunk of the film, your heroes are tied up doing nothing. And then when they get free, they suddenly have like the special power needed to beat the bad guys when all the people who live their life violent can't. It The absurdity of the story just kind of broke my brain. It, <laughs> and I, I like absurd stories too. So it's not a f- the fact that it's absurd, but it's the fact that it's so sporadically absurd and the tone doesn't ever seem to properly mesh together to make it a cohesive whole. Yeah. Yeah, I I feel like if the performances weren't, they they do feel a little uh, like they're sleepwalking at times. And if they would have, we're not talking about Charles Dance here, though. We're talking about the uh, oh, Charles great. Dance is actually he's bringing great. it. Like See, Charles it, Dance it, was the most underrepresented actor of the '90s <laughs> until Game of Thrones. We were giving right. him crap like this. That's not <laughs> fair. Oh yeah, no, he's bringing his A game, and and that's the thing. Our three leads, you know, and I, I aren't aren't bringing that gusto to the role. And if they would have just it, gone for really it, and, and 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 realized what kind of film they're in, yeah, this could have been you know amped up a little more. But yeah, I mean, I for this one, it the rewatch was a little tougher than when I first saw it. When I first saw it, I just had such a blast with it with it and and, Same, and loved absolutely. it absolutely just because i had it was just i knew it was goofy like i knew going in it was goofy and i'm a, i'm i'm pretty easy going with goofy bad movies um but uh but i mean this is only well, about 90 so bad it's good like, right yeah yeah i mean but this is it's pretty short but it's almost like they can maybe even even lose 10 minutes of this and maybe it'd be right little, there in the middle later. where they're tied up. Yeah, because that like, kind of drags. There's no, there's no reason to keep that drag in. Yeah. But yeah. there is actually one other thing I want to say, which is that throughout the film. Um, oh, what, what was the lead woman's name again? Uh, Debbie? Yeah. Um, Debbie is Cindy. Com- it, it, Cindy, okay. But it's Debbie Mazar, is yeah. that it? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm terrible with names, but she, throughout the thing, like when she first gets on the ship in zero gravity, it's like, oh, my bra and my panties are going, and like she's just <laughs> completely, she's completely sexualized, but also tr- almost inf, in, uh, like treated like like turned into a child, infantized or whatever. I can't, uh, I can't word apparently. Infantized. Infantized. Thank you. Is that a Thank word? you. Like, yeah, that's the one. I'll like she this. is, because she, she's always kind of like the. They always treat her as if not just are they patriarchally in charge, but they also kind of treat her as if she can't make her own decisions yeah. because she's younger than them. And it's this very, <laughs> it, it 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 especially with the fact that it sets up a lead between the older gentleman and mm-hmm. her. Like it it touches a uh, Lolito realm, which is altogether uncomfortable and unnecessary. Yeah, no, definitely. There's some politics in this that are. Uh, uh, they're definitely off, you know. Yeah, they're not, they didn't end up on the right side of history. No, yeah, definitely. This is not. Uh, there's, there's, there's no, uh, there's no f- real positive feminism going on in here in in this film. This is definitely <laughs> a, feminism at all. No, this is definitely a, a, a boys' club film. Um, unfortunately, right. The the women characters in this film aren't treated very well because she could be you know she could she, be but like her mother she's just property at the exactly. end exactly and that's i think that's the 
And, you know, yeah, I mean, that, I think that's what this time around, maybe that's it. Maybe this time around watching it, especially with everything that's been, that's been going on politically, this, maybe that's the thing in my, the back of my mind is especially how they treat Cindy's mother and Barbara Crampton is just, she's just a prop. Oh, look, this hot young blonde uh, who is is my age, but, you know, she's like super hot and maybe I can bang her. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just yeah, like, yeah, th- that's that's definitely, there are some, some issues there. Um <clears throat> But I feel like that's not surprising if you've seen any of Stuart Gordon's previous films, because I don't know if he, um, you know, I, I feel like that's kind of how most of his women have been treated. He did. He tends to at least let them let them control, except for maybe uh, Reanimator. He yeah. tends to let them control their own sexuality for right. one which this feels like that has been taken but even in reanimator and specifically his next couple they dev they have their own um their own oh, sense of agency which okay. does not feel like it's in this one debbie yeah. does get to go like oh i will sleep with him and she makes that decision but she makes it for them not yeah. for her really yeah so it Ah, oh, yeah, no, it, it definitely did not come out on the right side of history. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting, and then and maybe that's that that might be part of it too. It, that's you know, and, and that's kind of what happens when you kind of go back and watch certain films, whereas the today's politics don't mash up with the politics of the time, or maybe they were. Yeah, even you should have saw what happened when them. I watched Straw Dogs. Oh Ooh. my God! I, I, <laughs> yeah, exactly, and that's a film that I've like, I don't think I can ever go back and rewatch that film. You know, it's it's very interesting how that happens. But so, you know, with that said, um, Space Truckers is out on Blu-ray in the UK. And this is Second Sight Films put this out that does have some great interviews on here um, with Stuart Gordon, with their, the composer and with the art director. And so it was fun oh, to kind the of art director. I would like to listen yeah. to. So it was fun to kind of dive in a little bit with, with the film, you know, it's uh yeah, it's, I tried to look at this with nostalgic eyes a little bit, but I did have some issues with it, but it was a fun, it's still a fun revisit. And if you've never, if you've never seen this and you're curious, I would definitely say, give it a shot. See if you like it. Um, I would say that it is a curiosity yeah. in that it, like it never hits so bad that it's good, mm-hmm. but the entire way through it, you're kind of like, wait, why? It, that's the decision you're going with, <laughs> and you're always kind of baffled that they seem to miss the mark of what the story should be. Yeah, yeah, it definitely has moments of some uh, some goofy sci-fi genius. It ha- it has its its moments that are that in maybe in a different film or maybe even in. If they had a little more money and they can do another pass on the script or maybe they can even do some of the set pieces they wanted to do. You know, I know that a lot of decisions happen on this film because of the budget. So but I mean, with a small budget, they they did all they could. You know, they really did all they can do. I I don't think, you know, Stuart Gordon is ever going to be a any a prolific science fiction director. I don't I think his wheelhouse for me always landed more in the kind of. Uh, a horror genre um, with creatures. He is the like master He's, of Lovecraft adaptations. Yes, yes. So, it, you know, I don't know if he was ever going to create like a, a really good science fiction film, but... Uh, but except seeing, for Fortress. Except for Fortress. Robot Jocks is pretty cool too, but even that, like even the future Robot is Jocks still is good, of, but it needs one more fight in the middle. Yes. It's got yes. a great fight at the beginning and the end, but the middle just drags. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to be planning a... Uh, we're going to cover the tri- these, those, those kind of trilogy of films, Crash and Burn, uh, Robot Jocks, and Robot Wars, eventually on the Xenopod. That is that is going to happen. So I need to kind of uh, gather a ragtag team uh, for that discussion. But um, but definitely, like, his idea of the future, his the, the design, is never, like, that amazing. You know what I mean? It's always a bit bright and a bit fake-looking. Um, well, not only that, but also it doesn't actually do all that much future playing instead it's yeah. parody in the highway system and <laughs> yeah yeah so like the the threat isn't that isn't some actual sci-fi thing that would be a threat the threat is black rock which just was meant to be black 
ice. Ice, like ice, yes. when when they need to when when he tries to escape the station and they they're going out through the trucking lanes which have a whole ton of billboards mm-hmm. in space. <laughs> Uh, he hits one of the billboards to make it like fly back and hit the cops after him, which I don't know. Um, I'm not the scientist, but I'm pretty sure <laughs> gravity doesn't work in space. Yeah, there's a lot of science science problems. If you're looking at this from a science lens, uh, definitely there are <laughs> a lot of egregious uh, mistakes, or they didn't really think about it. They they were just kind of using. Well, I don't I don't think that you know, Star I don't think Wars so science. much is that it was. A, yeah, I think that it was more they had the idea of like, okay, it wasn't the space truckers in the way that aliens had thought about it. It yeah. was literally, okay, we have truckers, ignore the space part, how can we just make a few of these into like jokes? And I think that's where the black rock comes from, Yeah, which I'm still, that scene, the fact that that's what stops them is so upsetting to me still. <laughs> They were going to have space pirates come in anyway. Why didn't they have the space exactly. pirates? Exactly. Just keep stop the space them. pirate a- aspect of it because that's great. The space pirate part of it is great. Um, so, like I said, like there's, man, there's, it's, yeah, it's a hit or miss. And depending on how frustrated you get with with uh, picking movies apart and everything, you know, there's definitely some things that could would probably probably keep you awake after the film <laughs> as you're thinking about it. But as a curiosity, I, me just as a, have your little brain goblins <laughs> pulling apart your wires going, don't don't form memories. Don't yes, form memories. Yes. As a curiosity, I definitely would say uh, take a look at it. The Blu-ray looks really good. Um, and I, this is one of those films. Yeah, I, I probably had more of a, a, nostal- a nostalgic uh, memory of it. Didn't hold up to that nostalgic memory, unfortunately. But uh, but this is this. This, I was going to say, like, this would be a fun one to watch with my kids. Then I'm like, oh, yeah, right, robot penis and robot butt. Yeah, uh, robot, uh, uh, maybe Yeah, not. maybe not. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's, just, it's just almost show like. Them, just show them the, the square pig scene. You know what's Tell them it's a short film. Right. You know what's frustrating with all that, too, is is um that that kind of thing in, like, a PG-13 film. Uh, do you remember that uh, the Kevin Costner Robin Hood film? Yes. And there's, like, a huge, like rape type scene in that film as well and i and i was like i'm thinking about it, i'm like i can't believe i watched that my parents let me watch that when i was when i was that young oh man because there is yeah. uh because i because i, 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 I thought about that, that. like i thought about that like oh man yeah let's let's, let's get family together and watch uh this robin hood prince of thieves thieves and i'm like oh wait never mind um there's like basically a rape scene in it so i was like never mind we'll Fast forward. <laughs> yeah. So and that's the weird thing about space truckers is these kind of it definitely. Well, it it's a PG-13 to, movie in what should have been an R. Either so, either like, they made it either they go R or they just stick with like a PG. You know what I mean? It, it, it does this weird, weird kind of uh, trying to please both and uh, doesn't quite work. So, well, uh, I think uh, I think that's space truckers, Zach, I think. We've successfully like picked apart space truckers for our listeners' pleasure. Another long haul successfully <laughs> handled. Uh, yep. Check it well, out. I have to uh, say, ch- it's been it an honor to be here. Well, thanks, man. Thanks for doing this. This is a, this is a fun little side project that I do, and in, in once a month to try to get somebody on here to talk about some science fiction movies. You know, eventually, I would like to do more of these. Uh, more, you know. More than once a month. We'll see how it goes. It's, it's going to happen. I just got to, uh, you know, I have a lot going on. Figure so, the schedule out. So thank you for joining me on this. Uh, like I said, Space Truckers is, is on a uh, Region B locked Blu-ray you can get from Amazon.co.uk if you're interested. It's a bit pricey for the, but you can, you know, if you really love the film and you want to grab it, it looks great. Um, otherwise, you can grab a pretty cheap DVD um from Amazon and, and and find it streaming somewhere if you're if you're curious. So Zach, uh, if you can, before we sign off, let everyone know where uh, they can find you on the internet. Um, I got a poor network here, so I don't know if you can hear me now. I can hear you, but you can find me at Light Is Fading on Twitter or at Scriptophobics on Twitter and at www.scriptophobic.ca. Awesome. All right, Zach. Well, uh, thanks again, and uh, thank all of you guys for listening. I will talk to you next next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
I emit a low amp electrical wang pulse designed to drive women wild with pleasure. Ugh. Stop, you're gonna make me puke.